Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank and welcome to another episode of The Remnant Call. I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I'm telling you this, my mind is going crazy with everything that is going on in this world. And I don't mean crazy because I'm afraid and and scared. I mean crazy because there is so much wrong that's happening simultaneously. And it's like the churches are asleep. It's like pastors aren't preaching it's like at the moment that they should be screaming from the rooftops they are dead asleep and their members are starving to death in their own churches well i'll tell you what folks we are not going to be like that we are going to be awake in this hour and ready to share the good news with jesus we can't forget no matter how dark this world gets we still have a mission and that's to take this gospel to every living creature the bible says we must share the good news that jesus is truly coming again folks because they need your help the lost are lost and they you know what sometimes dealing with the lost they do things that the lost do so we may, we need to be patient we need to be kind we need to remember that god was patient with us but we not we cannot give up in this hour and simply only give in to the things that are going wrong and lose our focus on the mission because god is going to do something in this last hour that's so unbelievable we see these places that are so tough to get the gospel into north korea some places over in arabia in different places, Iran and China and different places like that, that are still tough to get the gospel through because they're under so much persecution. You know what's going to happen? God is going to tear down some of these walls that have been holding people back. The Chinese have been preparing for years to take the gospel back towards Jerusalem. It's called the Back to Jerusalem movement, where they're going to take the gospel through the Arabic countries on the old Silk Roads between China and, and Jerusalem. And you know what blows my mind is sometimes we forget america we think we're the only believers out there and you know what god's preparing people from all over the world to finish this work because in america we've had the blessing of the gospel but we have not been using it anymore it's time to wake up and we better be about our father's business well i can't think of anybody else better to have on the program right at this second to talk about these things that are going on in the world right now than my good friend brother jamie walden if you don't know who brother jamie is i'm going to bring him on here in a second he is the head of the omega dynamics he has got some new stuff i'm going to let him talk about that's going on at their ranch uh, out in colorado and so instead of me sharing all the things that he's done in his life it's if if you really want to know go to omegadynamics.org forward slash about dash me and this guy he doesn't even have half the things he's probably done on there on his website and you could check him out but i'm going to let him come on here and share a little bit about what they're doing right now and also about what is going on in this world right now so with that jamie are you here with me yeah i'm here with you brother thanks for having me on again hey god bless you and i'm glad to be here brother i'm just going to open up with a word of prayer and i'm going to ask would you pray for us tonight as we begin this show, that it would be to our heavenly father's honor and glory. Absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you, God, that you have given us space for grace, Lord, that there's still space to seek your face while it may be found, God. We know that the day is coming where there'll be a famine in the land, but not a famine of food or drink, but a famine of hearing of the word of the Lord. And men will stagger like drunkards searching for it, Lord, and they will not find it. And I just pray, God, over your people and over those who would hear that, that we would be good stewards of the gospel and of the freedom and of the grace that we have while we still have it, Lord. We know that there's a time coming. I mean, we're, we're um, very soon, a time coming very soon, God, where many of these things will be stripped from us. And I just praise you that we get to gather and even use so much of the technology that the enemy uses for evil, we get to use for good to the spreading of the gospel. And even like Brother Frank was saying to our radiant, vibrant, steadfast, firm in the faith, brothers and sisters all across the face of the earth who will not uh, be bewitched by a compromised gospel. And they have truly counted the cost of being all in for your kingdom, God. They counted the cost and they find it as nothing compared to the inexpressible glory of being united with your son, Jesus Christ. And so I just pray, Lord, that we too, even in this nation of influence and affluence and the dissipations that are so uh, constantly breathing down our necks that we would be unified with 
the rest of your body who is in eager anticipation, longingly waiting, looking, hungering, thirsting for you, Christ Jesus, speeding your coming and uh, advancing your kingdom, God, through this fog of war in this hostile territory. So I just thank you that we get to do that tonight, Lord, and we pray that you would bless us, Lord. I pray your blood over, over my lips and, and my mind and my heart over Brother Frank's as well, too. God, we know that Amen. we are men of unclean lips and we live among a people of unclean lips, Lord, but we also know the sufficiency of the blood of your son, and we just praise you for it. And we pray all these things to the powerful life-giving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Brother, before we get into tonight, I know you have been doing so much out at the ranch there. Explain to the people what's going on uh, out there right now in Colorado. Yeah, for sure. Now people always go, so what's going on out there? I'm like, I'm like bricks with no straw, man. That's what's going on out here. Like it's, we're working like Hebrew, <laughs> slave, working like Hebrew slaves, bricks with no straw, but uh, yeah, the Lord's delivered this, uh, this camp into our hands. It's called the Calico Buffalo base camp. I actually just launched the website yesterday. I've uh, been waiting, working for seven months, trying to get it up and running as we're, I'm basically full-time general contracting out here and building. And, and uh, we're trying to establish a network of faith havens all across the United States. Cause we know what's coming, but we also know the faithfulness of the Lord to draw us people to cities of refuge, to be provided for um, not to save their own flesh, but so that they can continue to advance the gospel, no matter how thick the darkness is over the earth and no matter how dense the fog of war becomes around them. And so uh, we're out here working. We call it the Calico Buffalo base camp. There's a lot, a lot behind the why of that. A lot of it has to do with the ephod, uh, the jewels in the ephod and the, and the living stones uh, that we are now being built into Christ on that new foundation and the new heaven and the new earth and the radiancy and the, the vibrancy of those stones that we're being built into their calico. And obviously, you know, the, the Buffalo is, is the only uh, bovine creature that has never been domesticated because it is so infused with the sense of freedom. It cannot be broken because he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So that's why it's Calico Buffalo base camp. If anybody was curious, I digress. So uh, yeah, man, we're out here working. We're actually getting ready to um, host a major uh, wor worship festival. It'll be the first thing we've done out here, but we're getting ready to, uh, the Lord just really burdened me to, that everybody's magnifying the darkness. And he said, gather my people to magnify my glory, Amen. to magnify the kingdom of light, to magnify the sufficiency of my son. I'm like, I don't know how to do that, Lord. And he just said, if you, if you bring them together, I'll show up, call the assembly together. So August 4th through the 7th here in uh, right outside Durango, Colorado, we are gathering for uh, four days of just magnifying the Lord, seeking his face, growing in fellowship with one another, uh, networking with the authentic body of Christ and getting into each other's reality in a way that produces sanctification. So that's what we're doing out here in August. If love to have you guys out here, you can get more details at uh, calicobuffalobasecamp.com or hearthewatchmen.com. There's all kinds of info on there as well. How far, brother, is it from Denver? Just because I happen to be coming out that very following week. Well, actually, it's crazy, dude, because the, the mountains, it's seven hours still from Denver. Wow. So, yeah, it's like it takes a long time to get around, man. But we're like literally on the San Juan Mountains. I mean, beautiful and whitewater rafting and all the mountain biking, and hiking, all the all the all the cool guys stuff is out here, you know, but uh it's interesting that the Lord drew us here. This is the four corners region. It is the highest spiritually charged place in North America. In fact, even the Aztec and the Mayan and the Incan, their, their uh, stories of origin come out of the four corners region where the Anastasia and the Pueblo. And it's, they, this is their central place. Like I'm literally, I'm looking out my window. I'm looking at Mesa Verde national park. It's like four miles away from our base camp, but they say that this is where the gods of old came out of the earth and rule and reigned and taught them cannibalism and all kinds of sexual perversities. And that's why the Anastasi were building in the cliffs and Mesa Verde was to try to get away from the giants, 30 footers that ruled in the land. And then they say a uh, great, powerful God destroyed them all in one foul swoop. That's what mm. they say. So anyways, it, it's interesting that this is where the Lord brought us specifically to establish 
a faith haven for his people. I mean, you couldn't write that only the Lord. Could. It's like, Hey, go to Canaan. That's the promised land. You're like, but it's full of Nephilim freak shows. He's like, no, that's the promised land. And it's like, that's where you're supposed to go. Go occupy it. Go take it. I've delivered it into your hands. So that's where we're at way down here, right in the four corners. Wow. Amen, brother. That's powerful. And I'm glad to hear that because God is overtaking that, which is his, he's taking it back. He's going to reverse everything that's been wrong. And folks, this is the hour. We are not called in the last days to just stand still and do nothing. We're actually called to move forward and to conquer. I mean, the gates of hell cannot hold back God's church. Yeah. And we we so often forget that. And we go to this, I don't even know what it is, but this protective defensive mode when God calls us to be of an offensive posture, brother. Oh, brother. I literally just preached on that Tuesday night. I'm like on fire. Like my bones are burning. Like I, I was specifically preaching that there is a direct inverse relationship to the nearness of the fullness of time and the activity of God's people inverse as the time draws nearer and nearer for the second coming of Jesus Christ, that people of God ought to be increasingly active for his kingdom. But the latest in church has done the exact opposite. They have grown in complacency. And so there's this major disconnect because we have been told that there those who are strong in the Lord, those who know their God, they will be strong and they will go forth and do exploits. We're told in Daniel 12 that, that um, those who are wise in the Lord will turn many back to righteousness and they'll shine like bright shining stars in the vast expanse of the universe from everlasting to everlasting. You know, we're told to Isaiah 60, like arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. Though darkness is over the earth and thick darkness is over the people you church you people of god arise and shine you know luke 21 when you begin to see all these things shut yourself in your prayer closet and, and pull on and hold on to your ira because the gas prices really went up and you don't know what's coming next that's not at all what it says it says when you begin to see all these things taking place you radiant church church those with ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the church you stand up and you look up because your redemption draws nigh. We're told of those who will overcome him, the Antichrist, and all the powers of darkness, everything that comes with this wicked global beast system emerging on the scene. It says, you will overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of your testimony. Boy, I know my God. And not loving your life so much as you're afraid to lose it. So there is a direct inverse relationship between the nearness of the fullness of time and the activity of God's people. Here is a woeful, woeful statement to those who have squandered the freedom from the sting of death, who have been the wicked servant who buried the talent that they've been given of eternal life, where they should be fearless, where they should be bold, where should, they should be steadfast, firm in the faith, dawn in the armor of God, being wise, not unwise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Where we should be that, where you have squandered it for self-preservation is the chief attribute of latency in church age. Self-preservation because of a love of pleasure rather than a love of God. A love of pre pleasure, baby boomers, retirees, IRA, 401k, actuary, penny pensioners, and everything that comes with it. It says he comes and he beats him with many blows. And he says, you wicked servant. You were a servant. It's a ser They're all equally servants of the Lord. But he calls that one wicked. We were speaking about this off air about I can't remember which letter to the church it is. It's one of the one of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, you know, which there's a lot of dispensational stuff going on there and, you know, partial fulfillment, full fulfillments and all this different stuff going on. But it says specifically repent. But if you do not remember who he's taught, this is the bridegroom speaking to the bride. This is the bridegroom speaking to a covenanted people, the church. It is a letter to the, to the church. He says, repent, but if you do not, I myself will come and fight against you. And actually the original translations renders, I will come and make war against you. But see, those are the things that the church doesn't want to hear. They, they want to be Pollyanna and they want to have their key cake and eat it too all the while having succumbed to the spirit of the age, which is a lover of self, period. 
Absolutely. And you know, that is true, folks. What Jamie is talking about here is, is so real at this moment. I mean, I, I I remember growing up, always hearing that this day would finally come, you know, and you kind of, after a while being a believer, brother, you know, I was converted in 1999, you know, you, you believe it's going to come, but you you start, I don't know when it's going to come. And now it's like all here, all at once, all of a sudden. And, you know, we are, we are completely, forgetting why we are called in this moment. We're forgetting what we, that we are to stand up in this hour instead of shrinking back. And we were talking about this also earlier that God is very specific in this hour of letting us know that this is actually, and I want to jump into this brother, the last days folks. And, and the Lord says out of everything in the Bible, Jesus says, there's just two, there's two things that you need to remember that will signal to you that the very end is here. And first he says, it's in the days of Noah, but he says, likewise, also in the days of Lot. And we were talking about this earlier. We are living in the days of Lot in such a fullness that Sodom and Gomorrah would be ashamed of what was going on today. That's how evil we are. Now, brother, I I didn't realize this the other day. I've read the story through a million times. It seems like a bunch of times in in Sodom and Gomorrah. But I picked something interesting popped out. Someone had mentioned it. And I was like, I never saw that. I went back and reread it. This is what it said. It said that when the angels came, it said that both the old men and the young came for them. This was a city so entrenched in homosexuality and sexual deviation and pedophilia that it was not only the young men, but the word in the Hebrew, the original language means boys were there also with them, the old and the young. This was a society where it was completely socially acceptable for your young child to live in a lifestyle contrary to the living God. That is the reality that we are now in today. And then you couple that with Romans chapter one, brother, and I'm going to turn this back over to you in just a second, that the Bible talks about that instead of glorifying God, the creator, we instead glorified creatures over the creation, over the creator. We've turned the image of God into four-footed beasts and everything else. And so now what we're doing is we are turning our children into things that are forbidden by God. Where men wearing women's clothes, it's forbidden. Women wearing men's clothes, it's actually forbidden in the Bible. Children changing their actual DNA structure by the latest, you know, jab that everybody's been taking. Everything we are doing now is changing the image. We are supposed to be imagers of God. We are to carry that image. That's actually about taking the Lord's name in vain. Is that so? It actually means is when we when we give a bad name to the image that we carry. It actually says to carry the name, the Lord's name, is what it says in the original. And and you look at these things that's going on, and you see that the results in Roman chapter one ends up with men burning one for another, doing that which is unseemly. That's the result, folks, that we are living in, and it has completely overtaken everything in our society. And I'm convinced now more than ever that everything that's going on wrong in this world comes back to sex. Yeah, it absolutely does. And when we look at it biblically, biblically, that it was at the root of it all as well, too, from Genesis 6 to Genesis 18 and onward. It is that it is the corruption of the human race it's the corruption of the identity of God. And it is the, what would be the word, the nullification of the covenantal or contractual agreement that God created. The first covenantal contractual agreement God created was marriage covenant between a man and a woman. It is the number one thing that the wicked, wicked perverts of this world want to overthrow is that covenant. The number one thing that God instituted for all the time to be a symbol of his, of his graciousness and mercy from time immemorial, the rainbow is the number one thing that they choose as their symbol to shake their fists in God. People think that this is a natural, like, are, are like, like there's, there's, um, it's just a, uh, an unbridled sexual perversity that's going on. It is not about 
sexual experience. It is about open warfare against a holy God. They all know exactly what they're doing. This is why every lesbian cuts her hair off. Most of them cut their hair off as soon as they make the commitment that they're an enemy of God. Why? Because scripture specifically says that a woman's hair is the glory of the Lord. And as a, as a matter of shaking their fist in his, is shaking wow. their fist in his face, throwing their finger up and say, I will not have this God rule over me. They cut off their hair. They take the rainbow, which is seven colors that God created, a number of perfection, holiness, completion, all these things. They reduce it to six, which is the number of man, sin, lawlessness, and they shake it in your faces. And they say, give us your children to eat as well, too. And the pathetic pathetic, complacent Christians, Christians are say nothings and do nothings. And these, these uh, baby boomers want to scream and yell about a mom who may be uh, open nursing in a restaurant or whatever, but they say nothing about the drag queens reading to their kids in their elementary schools. See, it's, it's amazing what offends their sensibilities. What offends their sensibilities is the Fed raising the interest rates three quarters of a percent. What does not offend them is Disney systematically indoctrinating their kids to be an enemy of God. That doesn't offend them. Why? Because that's what I enjoyed when I was growing up. So I don't want to deprive my grandkids of that well, too. They're not offended by the cell phones that are in front of their grandkids face every single second of the day, indoctrinating with all manner of perversity and wicked, wicked, vile things. The, Satan is the prince of the power of the heirs i.e. the internet waves. And that is how he's influencing everybody, but they don't care about that. See, because here's, here's what's at the root of this, of this overarching days of Lot, days of Noah. No, remember, days of Noah, it was the sexual corruption of the human race. Days of Lot, it was the sexual perversity of the human race in that regional area that was judged. Both things. And it says, as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot. That's what it's going to be like right before I return. And Romans 1, going back, I know I'm kind of all over the place, but Romans 1, jumping back to it, that one of the things that grieves me the most is the I guess maybe the Pollyanna or, or, or it's the like, hear no evil, see no evil posture, the majority of the American church where they go, boy, things are getting really bad, man. We need to repent because uh, things are getting really bad and, and we don't want to come under God's judgment. And I go, don't you understand Romans one, you are already under judgment. The LGBTQ alphabet community is the testimony of God that you are under judgment. It is the late sign that God has fully given you over. There is no repentance for this nation. It cannot happen. It is marked and sealed by God's immutable word. There is no repentance for this nation. It's like, how, how much more do we have to, to just Grow in the fear of the Lord to understand that we have been given over. That's why they can hologram the White House in a rainbow flag and nobody says anything. That's why I remember my niece, her first day in kindergarten came home with a lesbian book that her teacher gave her her first day in kindergarten. And you want to know what? She's not removed from the school. I'll just put it at that. Uh, Nobody's removed her from the school. Man, that's and, and it's so like it goes on and on and on. This is a late sign, ladies and gents. This nation is under judgment. And because this nation is under judgment, guess who the Lord deals with first? Ezekiel 9. He says, begin in the inner courts first. That's, right. that's who you begin with. That's because right. there's a reason why this is so rampant. And the reason why is because you say, you're wealthy and needed nothing. You meaning God's people. We're, not, right. we're, we're wealthy and in need of nothing. He goes, but you don't understand how I see you. Mm. You've never asked me how I see you. Ask me, Lord, how do you see us? Because I feel like we're crushing it. We got satellite campuses and we got capital campaigns. And have you seen our youth ministry? And have you seen our influence and affluence? God we're wealthy in the need of nothing, but nobody goes, God, how do you see us? And he goes, I'll tell you very plainly, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And I'm going to give you a little bit of counsel. You better repent. 
Absolutely. And you better purchase for me white raiments to hide your nakedness. And you better purchase for me gold refined in the fire. You better purchase for me healing bombs so that you might see. Repent. I am on the outside trying to get back in to your hearts and to your minds and to your daily disciplines and to your, to your effectual religion. I'm trying to get in. But you say, we will not have this man rule over us. What's it say in Jeremiah 6? The Lord goes, to whom can I speak and give warning? Uh, their ears are closed so they cannot hear. My word has become offensive to them. See, we're offended by the word of the Lord. We don't even want, you don't, I mean, I, I could, maybe this is facetious of me and presumptuous. I hope not. But I, I would presume that 99% of American pastors will not touch Romans one during pride month. Uh, brother, I, I, I want to say something about that. Thank you for coming right to there, because this is exactly what I wanted to say. Folks, these you have to stop. Almost, I had to learn this years ago. You got to stop looking at it, these poor people because they're being misled. The truth is their pastors are their judgment upon them because this is what they want to hear. Yes. Yeah, Amen. They, they want to hear this. And the church has already been judged. It is started in the house of the Lord. The churches are partially empty. And those that many of them that are actually thriving are thriving with such a false gospel that they don't even understand that they're underneath the judgment of God because their pastor is not following the Lord. And they're embracing the LGBTQ. They're embracing all these things because Satan, one thing he cannot do is he cannot create. So what does he got to do? He goes out and he tries to steal us that can create children, right? And so they ruin them with these drag things and everything's going on to corrupt our children because he couldn't create his own. It's what's been happening since the beginning. He's been angry at God. He's wanted to take God's children by getting them to follow him. And they're doing the same thing with our children today. And this is the judgment of God and it has fallen upon our churches. Yeah. And it says, it says, you know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because they've rejected knowledge, I will reject them from being my priest. And then it goes on to say, like people, like priest, now, Hosea four, right? Like, so like, so this, this is a reality. It's totally true. I've always said who would remain in a church. And, and besides like openly, I think one of, one of the biggest deceptions within the American church is they go, well, we don't openly support that. I totally stand against that. And I go, no, you don't. You won't say a word about it because you're scared about being persecuted, mocked, scoffed, or reviled for the cause of Christ. Therefore, you forfeited your blessing because it says, blessed are you. See, you won't weep and mourn over the sins of the people and over your own sins and the sins of your church and the sins of your pastor, the sins of your nation. You won't tear your clothes. You own a suit, but you do not own a suit of sackcloth right? Like, like you own beautification project products, but you do not have a bucket of ash to throw on your head because you will not experience discomfort for the cause of Christ. See, you are a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. You have the form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof, right? You are a lover of self. And so the, the most deceptive posture is they say, I totally disagree with that, but in complacency and in a love of self, they will not snatch those out of the fire. They will not abide by the words of Jude, right? And like show mercy to some others, they snatch out of, out of the fire because they fear the Lord. Because we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. So see, this is all muddled together. Like you remove the fear of the Lord from the pulpit. Well, why would you try to snatch men from the fire? You remove the fear of the Lord. Well, now you are a unwise. You remove the fear of the Lord. Guess what you won't do? You will not hate wickedness because that is a distinct attribute of the fear of the Lord. Those who fear the Lord hate wickedness. They hate it. Oh, I would never use the word hate. I love because Jesus loves. It's like, then you don't know your, you don't know your God. You don't know the King who bought you, you know, of him, you know, some, but you don't know him in full. But then those who do know the Lord, it does say like they will be strong and they'll go forth and do daring feats of valor. That's what that word exploits translates to. And, and so the complacency, it says the complacency of fools will destroy them. Woe to the complacent. Woe to you who feel secure in Samaria. You most notable men of the foreknows nation, woe, woe, woe to the complacent. And, and where the Lord always takes the blame, always, always, always takes the blame is to the shepherds. I mean, I remember doing a word study one time, just going words. Mm. My word study is like OG, like old school, like page by page. I just flip through 
to see things that I've circled, you know, whatever over the years. And, and I had everywhere where it said, woe to the priest or woe to the shepherds. And it was like, it was the common theme of why God dealt, did business with Israel and with Judah was because of the pastors, because of the pastors. That's why he always did business with them. And that's why he's going to do business with this nation as well is because of the pastors. And so that doesn't mean that the people aren't culpable, right? Culpability still resides with the individual person because there's a reason why you come underneath that pastor is because there's actually something in it for you. There's a reason why you would go to a mega church. You, it, dude, this is so crazy. Cause so like I've been in ministry for a while, I've been in the mission field about, you know, been uh, a pastor, done some church plans, stuff like that. People will not give, they will not donate until you look super affluent. Then they want to give everything to it because they want to, they want to show that they're a part of something affluent. It is the most disgusting thing ever when you are grinding it out because you just want to be faithful to the Lord and you fear, you walk in the fear of the Lord and you're entrusted to him. And every day you walk by faith and you feel like you're treading water and you're like, Lord, just help me to be obedient again today and not grieve your spirit. Help me to be obedient again today and not grieve your spirit. People will walk by you and scoff you and mock you and be like, what a pathetic thing. And as soon as you get put on some kind of pedestal where there maybe is some degree of worldly uh, validation, everybody wants to throw their money at you. It is the most disgusting thing ever. And that, and I'm not saying that I've experienced that. I'm just saying I've seen that because I'm, I'm, I live in obscurity, ladies and gents. So I'm not saying that because that's what I've experienced. I have just watched it happen to one ministry after another, after another, after another. Why? Because the people want the world and the things of the world. And I testify to this. This is a true and trustworthy stain. Anybody who loves the world are the things of the world. The love of the father is not in you. Period. There's no way around it. Yep. There is no way around these scriptures. Do not be unevenly yoked. What right is, what fellowship is there between light and darkness or between righteousness and lawlessness? BLM, Antifa, LGBTQ, the United States government, vote and Democrat, what you name it. What you cannot be unevenly yoked. Are you freaking kidding me? You think you can justify your, your voting record because of their policies? You are yoked with lawlessness saying that you stand for righteousness. You love the world and the things of the world saying that you represent a king and a kingdom. It's like the, the disparity and the self-deception of our hearts is so grotesque in this late hour. I don't know how the Lord continuously restrained other than he is so loving and so merciful and so forbearing. And filled with loving kindness beyond anything me and my carnal corporal reality can understand. It is amazing that he wants none to perish, that he is not slow in returning as some people call, count slowness because he is patient waiting for as many sons as possible to turn towards glory. It's insane given the rate at which we shake our fist in his face all the while saying we're doing this to honor you, God. Amen. And folks, you know, it wasn't it wasn't too long ago that it, the contrast that really it, this was probably maybe a week or so um, or two weeks ago, I was coming across the early. There was three different accounts um, of James, the brother of Jesus, martyred him that happened in ancient Jerusalem. Uh, Clement was one, uh, Josephus, and then. Um, Another guy, I can't think of his name. He was a historical uh, writer and, and recorder. Uh, and basically, the only, the only writings they had left is what Eusebius had quoted for him, from him. But they were talking about how James went into the temple and he prayed and he cried out for the people so much, Jamie, that his knees had become horny, almost like a camel's knees, because they were so worn out from prayer. And seeking the Lord's face and crying and interceding for the people. James was considered such a holy man of God 
that that when he was martyred, they believed that's what the reason that Jerusalem fell was because of his martyrdom. They had actually convinced him at one point. Well, they said they did. The, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees said, hey, these people are following Jesus. You need to come up and say this is madness. He agreed. They put him up on the pinnacle, the higher the high point there in the temple. And he proclaimed Christ even louder. And they stoned him to death. They Amen. stoned him to death. The man, and I look at today's society, and I'm wondering, folks, how, when was the last time we gave 10 minutes in solid prayer and weeping for the things that are going on in this world? When was the last time we cried out for the sin of these drag queens sitting in children's classrooms, teaching them ungodly things while their parents allow this stuff? If your child is being indoctrinated by this and you don't do something, shame on you. You know, my, my favorite quote I hear all the time from parents is, well, our kid, we want our kids to remain in that environment so they can be a light for Jesus. And I'm like, wow, how's that working out for you? As what are what is 99% of kids reject Christ as soon as they get out of their parents' household. How's that working out for you? You know, and it, and it, it's true. I, I, I've been told this by family members that are full-time pastoral ministry. They say, I, I hear what you're saying, Jamie, but I just don't want to walk around and feel sadness. I want to be positive, encouraging Caleb. I've, I've specific, not, I mean, not the positive, I'm being tongue in cheek with that, but like, I have specifically been told I do not want to experience that at all. And I go, oh my goodness, Ezekiel nine. Then the Lord sent out the messenger with the satchel. He said, put a mark and seal on the foreheads of all those who you find weeping for the sins of Jerusalem. They are not to be touched by the coming judgment. And if God, first Peter, and if God knows how to rescue Lot, that righteous man that was tormented, have you ever been tormented, listeners, in your soul? He was tor. I mean, think of the power of that word to be tormented. We only think it has to do with demonology to be tormented. He was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard in the day and night. And it says that the Lord knows how to rescue him. That the Lord knows how to rescue you. He was tormented. You have, you have uh, Jeremiah speaking about just being undone and torment and perplexity and consternation and the sins of the people. Isaiah says the same thing. David says the same thing. God, your word is not obeyed, O Lord. And they tear their clothes. And yet, and yet the pastoral ministers, I've heard it. I heard it in the mission field. I've heard it two times auto to myself spoken to me. I do not want to carry around that weight that you carry around. I want to have happiness, not even joy. See, there's such a, there's such a, 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 a what's the word? Like a, a, an apostasy within the church that they can't even distinguish happiness and joy. They use the word happy. Happiness is not a fruit of the spirit. Joy is. And in fact, joy comes in suffering. Joy comes in unity with Christ. Joy comes in the trials and tribulations. Joy comes in the multitude of fiery trials. Like there is joy in that, but see, they shrink back from all of it and they have forfeited, systematically forfeited, like Adam and Eve in the garden, forfeited the presence of God. The church has forfeited every single blessing that Christ laid out in the Beatitudes, forfeited them straight up. Won't do it. Won't mourn. Won't be poor in spirit. Uh, won't be persecuted. Won't be mocked. Won't be, won't be scoffed. Won't be reviled. I, I, I won't, I won't do any of these things. I will not be rejected by the world. I will perversely hijack the scripture about being all things to all people to mean that I can love the world and things of the world. I can look like the world. I can walk like the world. I can operate my finances like the world. I can have a hot mess marriage like the world around me. I can throw my kids into the world, even though it says fathers teach your children, the great and awesome deeds of the world of the Lord. So they will not be stiff necked and rebellious like their forefathers, but would learn to fear the Lord and put their trust in him. See, I, we have systematically rejected every single attribute of the word of the Lord. It is insane. It isn't, it's, it is delusion. No, it, that's it. It's delusional. It is insane. It's beyond insane. It's delusional because we've been given over to it and it is not quit attributing what's going on to the powers of darkness. I, this is one of the things I speak to regularly um, on the air or just, you know, dialogue with, sorry, 
by the way, let me apologize for my emphatic nature tonight. I get a little bit of animated. Okay. Like I'm, I'm not always brother, no apology, but, needed. but, but there's intensity here. Right. But, I, but, um, I hear this all like, I'm like, quit, quit magnifying the powers of darkness and all the, all the global elite and the luminous and the bloodlines, you know, and the Nephilimic hijacking and, and all these things. And it's like, yes, that's all true. But what you're not understanding is the power and the sovereignty and the supremacy of God can calamity come upon a nation unless the Lord has decreed it. No, it cannot. The Lord is the one who decrees calamity on a nation. The Lord is the one who allows the powers of darkness to carry out their wicked schemes. And the Lord is the one who sends the delusions. The powers of darkness didn't create the delusions. God says he sends them. That they Second may be damned. Two, Romans 1. God is the one who has put this on a reprobate wicked nation. Deuteronomy 28. Look at the curses of God. It says they will grope like a blind man in the darkness. They will have madness of mind. They will be blind, deaf, dumb, and literally mad. It just says they will eat their children in secret. It will be like, it's insanity. And this is God's doing, not the powers of darkness. See, the, uh, side note, same thing with all the judgments going on in the earth, uh, uh, tangibly, physically, in the natural, right? These, these, these objective, quantifiable uh, judgments that are going on in the earth, what man keeps trying to do is get you to attribute them to global warming, to get you to attribute them to natural earth cycles, to get you to attribute them to anything other than a holy God so that you will never bow your knee and repent to him. Same thing with the apostate church keep going, oh, geez, the powers of darkness. Oh, geez, the powers of darkness. Oh, geez, it sure is getting bad. And it's like, that's God's doing. Repent for the day the Lord is at hand. The message has never changed from Pentecost until the last second when Christ returns is repent for the day the Lord is at hand. Mm. Brother, praise God. I, I'm going to church tonight right here on this program. I appreciate it, folks. This is this is real. And this is and this is the hour. And, and, and just a, a side note, if you want to go and look up the martyrdom of James, I, I, you should read it. It's inspiring. OK, his name was the chronicler was his name was Hegesippus, Hegesippus, the chronicler. Go look it up and read what he wrote about James, who was the brother of Jesus, but knew that Jesus was Lord. Okay. He might've been his brother, but he didn't use that for power. No, he was there to serve. Okay. And even though he had this relationship uh, in the family growing up, he understood Jesus's position and he paid for it with his life. Brother, I, I I'm telling you, this kind of commitment, God is calling us to this James style. I'm not saying you have to beat your knees up as bad as James. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that there's this commitment that says it's all about Jesus. It's all about the Lord. It's all about his kingdom. And it doesn't matter what else is going on. Folks, we were talking about this, Jamie and I, before. I'm still running a business. I I I understand I, I've got to work, but if it all burns, it doesn't matter because I'm not taking a dime of it with me. I'll be so glad when the stress of this world is over with. I'll be glad when this thing is all done because, folks, I'm looking forward to saying goodbye to this world, to this the sufferings that are going on right now. But God is calling us to a level of commitment that's so deep because he wants us to be able to hear his voice and understand everything Jamie and we and I have been talking about tonight, the wickedness that is going on in the world. We have to be tuned into the truth so that we can hear clearly, so we can obey the instructions for this last hour on what we are supposed to do. The Lord promised in Micah that the Lord himself will lead us. Don't put any trust in a man, a blind guide. The best of them is but a thorn hedge, the Bible says. We are to wait upon the Lord. He will lead us through just like he led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. The Bible is very specific. In the book of Jeremiah, it's repeated two times that there is a second exodus that is coming for God's people. And we need to be listening for when that moment is. Listen, God may call us out of this country. He may call you to stay right here, but 
but you better not do anything until you hear from the Lord directly. Brother, I appreciate that you are following God's command in this hour to create a place for God's people to worship in such a moment as this. Amen. It's absolutely the only thing that will stand the test of time is your praise of worship. Your the, the words of your lips and the meditation of your heart. You have nothing else to offer the Lord. Nothing. You have nothing that there's no acceptable offering or sacrifice that you could possibly bring him other than a pure and sincere heart of worship. This is a man who I esteem him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. And it is the worshiping warriors that the Lord puts at the front of the army. It is the worshiping warriors calling down the coalition of heaven's armies and magnifying the power and the sufficiency of God alone that strikes down the powers of darkness and throws the dread of the Lord over all of his enemies and routes them like he did in second Chronicles 20. It is the magnification of the Lord alone, ladies and gents. We must magnify the Lord and stop magnifying the darkness. Stop magnifying the failings of your flesh. Magnify the sufficiency of Christ. Stop magnifying your double-mindedness and your lack of faithfulness. Magnify the fact that his faithfulness is your shield and buckler. Stop magnifying what the global or leader doing and magnify what the Lord, your God is doing. He is the one sifting. He is the one separating. He is the one making right divisions. He rightly divides it's all things, sheep and goat and wheat and tares and light and dark and, and heirs of a promise from sons of disobedience and those who remain under wrath from those who are no longer under wrath and co-heirs who are going to rule and reign with Christ from those who are of their father, the devil. He is dividing everything, ladies and gents. Glorify him and magnify him. Don't shrink back. Don't be like the disciples who in such ignorancy and arrogancy who, who sinned, this man or his father, none of them. This happened so that I might display my glory. This man was born blind. He lived in darkness. He dwelt in darkness for this very moment in time that I might display my power before you and before all those with eyes to see and ears to hear that I am who I said I am. We ought to be preparing for the outpouring of God's spirit to do something we couldn't even conceive of. We ought to be preparing for the fulfillment I know there's types in there with Jerusalem and the temple and all that, but to, to Zerubbabel through Haggai, that the latter glory would be greater than the former glory. And we ought to take heed when he says, work, for I am with you. Do not fear. Work, work. I've covenanted. I covenanted with you when I drew you out of Egypt that I'm going to be with you, Haggai, too. The gold and the silver are mine. Do not fear. Be strong and continue to work. We ought to heed the words in Ephesians 5 that say, you were once in darkness, now you're in light. So you better start acting like it, boy. Act like the child of light that you now are. You better make manifest the fact Amen. and you better redeem the time for the days are evil. Be wise, not unwise, ladies and gents. Begin redeeming the time. We ought to be like those uh, wise virgins with our lamps filled with oil, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing in eager anticipation, waiting, longing for our bridegroom, ready and prepared for every good work, not growing weary and doing good, knowing that at the proper time, we will reap a harvest of peace. Mm, this amen. is what we ought to be doing, not shrinking back, not hiding in our prayer closets, not shrinking back, knowing that if we shrink back, he will be displeased with us. We ought to be those who are courageous and steadfast, knowing that you, your life is hidden in Christ. When you know that, not when you say that, but when you know it, when you have an intimate knowing of it, all the anxieties and dissipations of this life fade away. Nothing matters, but the glory of your King. Mm -hmm. And it is all literally light and momentary afflictions compared to the inexpressible glory of being united with Christ Jesus. I know I'm mixing all kinds of different verses together, but this is the, this is the power and the sufficiency of Christ in us that the church must know in this late age. And when we testify to it, remember they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. I'm not scared of losing my life. I'm covered by the blood of the lamb. I have eternal life in Christ Jesus. My life is hidden in him by the word of their testimony. Boy, I know my God. Mm. I know my sonship. I know my king. I know the king that I serve. I am going to testify to all day long. And I do not love my life so much as I'm afraid to lose it because I understand and I have a knowing of the sufficiency of Christ. Mm. You know, the most fearsome dude on the field of battle was a guy that had no fear of death because he is, he was already dead to self. 
Oh, he amen. was already dead to self. He went on the field of the battle knowing that nobody could take his life because he was willingly laying it down. He didn't care what the cost was. That is the man to be feared. That is the man that goes forth spiritually in the strength of the Lord and does daring feats of valor, not for his own vain self-exaltation, that the Lord's fame and renown would be known in the land once more. That's what it's all centered on, ladies and gents. And that's the posture with which we should be seeking the Lord, glorifying the Lord, magnifying the Lord, letting the Lord undo us, consecrating ourselves to the Lord. Let him search out our heart, surrendering things that we've been holding on to for a long time, walking in the radiancy that Christ died to make us. He died to make you ready. We ought to be walking in that in such a knowing that literally nothing on this earth, like Psalm 112 says, not even the bad news, we would have no fear of it. Our hearts Amen. are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Our hearts are secure. We mm. have no fear. Amen. Amen. Folks, none of this tonight that we've been going over. I mean, we, we, Jamie and I talked at the beginning, so much on our minds that we just said, Let, let's just let God lead. Right through this program. This has not been a written out diagram we're following. Folks, I believe that the Lord wants us to truly get in tune with him. And and this, if you remember one thing the devil wants to do, he wants to take away that daily sacrifice. It was the whole abomination of desolation. You remember in the Bible, this is not the time we take away the daily sacrifice in our life. Folks, if you're not aware, the entire sacrificial system is still alive in the New Testament. It's spiritual. It says we are to build up, we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices, it says in First Peter. And it says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. See, if you're brokenhearted right now, if you're tore up over what's going on, God sees your sacrifice. He understands it. When we praise, the Bible says that the sacrifices of pray, that we are to give sacrifice of praise to God continually. And then the Bible says that our prayers are like incense. Okay. They come up as incense before his altar. Amen. This is not the time to remove the daily sacrifice, but instead, folks, we need to make sure that it is going on continuously in our lives at this hour, because this is how we are going to combat and keep from getting sidetracked. It's by putting our focus on Christ. You have not the power. You are not strong enough. You're not good enough. You're not perfect enough. You will never read enough scripture to be able to take care of yourself in this last hour, but God will do it. Amen. But the daily sacrifice must be reinstituted into the body of Messiah at this moment. Brother, we are coming to the end of the show, and I want just to end with a word, something to share with the people, because we've talked about everything that's going on. Brother, what is your advice for this hour for the people of God right now? My advice is to get very, very serious about magnification, right magnification. And the magnification is of the Lord. I speak about it all the time. Magnify, whatever you magnify becomes exponentially bigger in your field of view. Hence magnification and all the periphery gets blocked out. It zooms in and all the anxieties and dissipations of this life, by the way, all the anxieties and dissipations, dissipations means indulgence and sensual pleasure and expenditure and frivolous consumption. Sound like an American Christian, American churchianity? Yes. It says, watch out lest the dissipations and the drunkenness and the cares of this life overcome you. So the day of the Lord comes upon you while you're unaware. So you magnify the world and the things of the world. You magnify the world and the things of the world. It is time that the people of God magnify the Lord alone. King David had such an understanding of the Lord's heart that he commanded his faculties to do it. He took dominion through the spirit in him. He took dominion over his faculties. He said, lips open, tongue praise, mouth sing, heart magnify, eyes look. He commanded his faculties. Because he knew that nothing, nothing, nothing in his life would satisfy. 
other than the very near presence of the Lord in his life. He did not care about kingship. He did not care about influence. He did not care about affluence. He did not care about validation. He did not care about the riches of this world. He wanted God's presence in his life so much so that he longed to be back on the mountains, shepherding sheep, where it was just him and the Lord walking in the coolest of the night where he could commune with his God once more without any of that garbage surrounding him. It is time that we magnify the Lord and we make space for him to do what only he can do. We cannot magnify the church and we can't magnify uh, doctrines and theologies and we can't magnify movements and platforms and we can't definitely can't magnify politics or anything else as the solution. It is the Lord God alone, the Holy One of Israel. Look upon the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were hewn, the Lord God Almighty. You, like living stones, are being built upon that. And we have a mission set that is immovable and shakable in this generation for those with ears to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen, brother. Thank you for that. Folks, take heart. Your God is alive and he's on the throne and he's got a plan for this last day. Nothing that's happening in your life and in this world has taken him by surprise, but we need to institute that praise as brother Jamie was just saying, begin to magnify God, lift him up, sing to his name, worship him. Folks, when we get into prayer and you feel like your, your prayers aren't going above the ceiling, it's okay. Tell the Lord about it. Father, I'm trying to pray right now and I'm just not feeling it, Lord. I feel like nothing is going on, God, and I need your help to pray. Lord, I feel like this is nothing but brass walls all around me. Lord, I don't understand it right now, but I'm just going to stay here, Lord, and I'm going to keep praying because I know, God, you will break through. And folks, sometimes we got to be patient. We got to be patient, but know this, that if Job would have went upon his feelings, he would have cursed God and died. But because he knew the truth of who his father was, who his heavenly father was, he stood by the faith in the word of God. Then he knew that God's word was better than his own feelings. Therefore, he didn't listen to his wife and what she said. He didn't listen to his friends and when they put him down. And at the end, God magnified and glorified Job on this earth. And folks, I'm telling you right now, we need to take the time. Even when you don't feel it, trust me, your God hears it. Brother, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. God bless everything that you're doing. And I appreciate you folks. If uh, Jamie, if people want to keep up with what's going on, support your ministry, all that, how can they do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. They can find me at omegadynamics.org. That's kind of the book, you know, landing page or whatever, or uh, calicobuffalobasecamp.com. Like that's just what the Lord's led us to really focus on now is, is uh, you know, um, setting up networks of home churches and faith havens and drawing God's people together to be strengthened and equipped, not for the days that are ahead, but the days are that are here right now. Mm-hmm. And again, just as a, as a, as a quick little plug, I guess, for lack of a better better word is we would love, love, love to have you out here to magnify the Lord. Cause I know like waiting for the Lord in Jerusalem at Pentecost, that those who are willing to wait on the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will. That's a declarative statement. They will renew their strength. And we know that the Lord will move mightily when his people magnify them and stop magnifying themselves. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you, folks. Keep looking up. It won't be long. Your God is coming down. This is Brother Frank and Brother Jamie Walden on the Remnant Call saying to everybody, good night and shalom. Trumpet in Zion, sounded on the mountain. The trumpet in Zion.